Awesome, bud. Awesome. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Woo! Going to take you guys on the road with me. That was crazy. Awesome to be here. Thanks for uh, sticking out here on Tuesday. Um, so that, that really was the message to me, even in scale. One of my best mentors, I said, I'm worried about scale. And he looked at me, he said, look at everything you do in a week. Those are all blockers to your scale. All of that stuff, when you're 10 times bigger, you can't be doing any of it. And so for agencies, I talked to a lot of you, and I was like, okay, what, what are your blockers? And so many of you have delegated delivery, not that hard, operations, finance, but to the survey we just did, what about sales? Are you doing most of the sales? How do you scale it? And the questions were, well, I can't find anyone. I can't find anyone that do, does what I do. I can't afford them. How can I compete with the tech companies? And that's what we hope to demystify here, is how can you look forward in a given year and you have a big revenue target and you, don't, as the, the agency owner, you don't have to close one of those customers. That's when scale is really going to happen fast. So that's what I'm going to try to unlock. When I talk to folks about their scaling, you folks are a lot better than this, but like the, some of the businesses I talk to, like, oh, yeah, how are you going to scale? Like, well, I want to hire salespeople and give them a territory and a quota. What we really want to bring to life here is a machine, a sales machine. And that's what I want to talk about how we build. So the machine is built on who we're going after. All of you have slightly different target markets. Who is that? What is their buyer journey that they go through when they think about your service? And let me build a sales process on top of that buying journey. We're going to talk about how to do that. There's two inputs to the machine. You put two inputs to the machine, salespeople and demand. I'm going to talk about how you can find salespeople and make a mere mortal be able to follow the process that you do. Demand gen, I'm not, I don't have time for today, and you folks are pretty good at demand gen. I think you folks are pretty good at demand gen. The machine runs on three pieces. How you coach your reps, how you compensate your reps, and your pricing model. The pricing model sort of dictates how your buyers and their sellers behave. That's how our machine runs. I'm going to talk about the coaching a little bit on the compensation. And three things come out of that in sequential order. The first thing that comes out is some sales activities, some demonstrations, some pitches, some proposals. Then comes out a forecast, and then comes out revenue. That's the machine that we're going to build. Okay, and I will post these slides if you don't want to take pictures. All right, that's where we want to get. So let's start off with the sales process. How a lot of you folks, to, to be in this room, to have gotten where you are, I, I think like less than 1% of human beings are natural born sellers. But sales can absolutely be taught. It can absolutely be taught. So the question is, how can we codify what we do so a mere mortal, maybe even someone that isn't even in sales, can learn to do what you do just as well, okay? So let's, start, let's just level the playing field and talk about what is good selling. Quick survey, sort of an image question. Who is the salesperson here? The money-hungry, good-looking guy on the left or is the helpful young lady on the right? Is it the sleazy cigar smoker or is it the thoughtful academic? Who's the salesperson? Is it the devil or is it the doctor? Okay, kind of interesting pictures, but like if you do a search in Google for salesperson, every image on the left shows up <laughs> and none of the images on the right. Are you kidding me? Like a hundred years ago, we invented this field called sales. What do they do? They go out into the market and represent us with our potential buyers. And over those hundred years, they evolved to become money hungry, sleazy devils. And they're not known to be helpful, intelligent professionals. And that's all different now. Folks are completely empowered. In fact, we have names for that type of selling. Show up and throw up. Show up and throw up. Poor selling. Alligator selling. Little ears, big mouth. Right? In the last session, they talked about listening. This is the type of, everyone's asking me every week, what, is AI going to disrupt sales? Is AI going to disrupt sales? This type of selling is, lar is largely going away. It's amazing how many sales professionals still teach, uh, still sell that way. And because of, you know, we, I'm not going to give you all the stats about today's buyers empowered. We talk about that stuff all the time. Here's some great, anybody know Gone.io? This company's on fire in San Francisco. Gone, G-O-N-G, I got the 
link down there. You can check it out. Out of San Francisco, they're bringing sort of machine learning and AI to sales. They're finally codifying what we've been talking about. This is a, um, so what they do is they have software that um, listens to your sales calls. And they, they sort of, they, they segment what's going on. Who's talking, the buyer or the seller? What are they talking about? Are they talking about product, competition? Is it an objection? They have these really cool algorithms to figure that out. So this was like, I think, 50,000 sales calls across like 700 companies. Top third performers talk 46% on the first call. Bottom performers talk 72%. Stuff we knew, but that's a big difference, okay? Here's what the call looks like. Top performers, look, they spread the questions across the call. They switch speakers every three minutes, about 12 switches in that hour. Bottom performers, all the questions come up front. They pepper them with the same questions, and then they just talk, right? This is the codification that's coming out. And this is what the call looks like. Five minutes of rapport, three to four business issues, not features, not insights, not services, business issues that they're talking about, and then setting the next step. So there's some guidance on what we want to codify for a mere mortal. Now, I think we as founders, as agency leaders, potentially as a, if you have sales enablement, we are causing the show up and throw up because I wish I used the word services here, I apologize, but we, we start with what we're offering in our service and we build a pitch deck, and we build a website, and we build a brochure to tell everybody what that thing does, and we give it to our salespeople and say, go sell, and that forces the show up and throw up. But instead, what we really wanna do is teach our salesperson first and foremost about our buyer. Let them figure out who the buyer is, and then use that to figure out how to sell them and position your service. Many people take an inside-out approach and I want to teach you an outside-in approach. Okay, so that's going to start with a buying journey that sits on the bottom. We build a sales process on top. I'm going to throw out four pieces to the, the journey. Right, uh, four of these, I'll give you examples of each. Okay. And the other thing to think about, do any of you actually have sales training in your organization? If you think, or maybe some of the organizations you go into, good question to ask them. What percent of the sales training is about the product or service? And what percent is about the buyer? Most sales training organizations I see, it's just all about the product and the offering. And there's very little about the buyer. And so you nodded your head yes to a lot of things I've been saying so far. I think this has just spilled over some, from some legacy ways that we used to sell. Okay, so what is a buying journey? I use a simple framework. Awareness, consideration, decision, success. Here's a case that we teach at Harvard Business School around a company called Datico. I pulled this one because it actually is a marketing agency. So what they do is um, they're an agency that has a software capability and a services capability. And what they do is they help large organizations to understand their return on ad spend, okay? So the way that this company would teach their salespeople is they say, okay, at the awareness stage, what are we hearing from our potential buyers before they even know our company exists. What are they talking about in terms of the challenges? What are their biggest challenges? What are the opportunities they go after? What's the terminology that they use? Well, sometimes they need to just calculate their you know, return on ad spend. Sometimes they need to lower their cost of customer acquisition. Sometimes they have trouble with attribution. And sometimes they want to invest in brand equity. OK, so great. So how do they think about solving that from a category perspective? Well, I talked to some people and they said they built an internal tool. They hired a consulting company to help them. They're going to buy some software. But we're in the box of software plus consulting. So may maybe they're looking for both. That's good news for us. And the orange here tells us what is the advantage of our category? We're in the software plus consulting category. How do we differentiate from the other options? And if they say, yeah, you know, I do want to I, I, I am looking for so a software combo consulting hybrid. Well, how are you making the decision? Are you looking for the cheapest? Are you looking for the one that's been around the longest? Are you looking for the one that has the most experience in my industry? And your orange box there tells you your unique differentiation relative to the competitive landscape. And then finally, how are they going to measure success? Remember, this conversation ideally is happening before they even know what we have. 
before they even know what we have. I want my buyer, my, my seller, sorry, to point where they are. Now, the red boxes are misaligned with our value prop. If they're in the red box and I don't reframe their perspective, they're going to buy someone else. But if they're in the green box, they're, they're, they're around us. Now, you and I can sell anyone in any one of those boxes, but the pitch is very different. And that's the difference between a natural-born seller. They understand how to do that versus a mere mortal. And this becomes a blueprint on how to Ask questions with a purpose to understand where is the buyer in their perspective before they know much about our service, and then do the right pitch, okay? So when they are in a red box, my students will ask me, and the, the companies I invest in will ask me, well, how do I know if I should try to reframe that? Isn't that unethical? Isn't that selling ice to Eskimos? And I'm like, yeah, don't sell ice to Eskimos. This is what you want to do. If someone walks in and they, they, they explain to you their problems and they say, we really want to invest in brand equity and we don't help with brand equity, what you want to ask yourself is if you quit your job and you were in their shoes, would you agree with them? Or do you think they're wrong? Do you think they're making a mistake with their strategy? If they're right, walk away. To invest, introduce them to a partner that helps with brand equity. Ask for a referral to someone that you can help. But if you are in their shoes and you think brand equity is a joke for them and they should be investing in lowering their CAC, then you've got to reframe that perspective. But regardless, the pitch is different. So our first piece is helping our sellers understand the buyer journey. Okay, let's talk about prospecting. Have you seen this data from InsideSales.com? This is good stuff. Ah, oh, geez, I rarely walk into a company, and this may help you if you, if you help folks on the sales consulting side, there's so much opportunity to just improve the efficiency against the leads and demand that they're getting. So what this analysis shows is, what's the best time to call a lead? It's 8 a.m. and 4.30. Now what's interesting is like, if you walk into some of these like bro sales teams out there, what's like a salesperson's day? They wake up, 7.30, hit the gym, right? Then they come, take a shower, they come in the office, 9 o'clock, they're getting a coffee, talking to their friends. 10 o'clock, they hit the phones. 12, they go out to their favorite lunch place. 1 o'clock, they hit the phones again, maybe do a couple demos. By 4.30, they're on the foosball table drinking a beer. You know what I mean? It's like completely opposite. This is what it should be. Wake up, hit the phones from home. Right? Hit the phones. That's when the, you, you folks are executives. You're in meetings all day. You are on email on your phone in the morning. Wake up, hit the phones. Then go to the gym at 9.30. Take a shower, get in the office at 10.30. Do your meetings, have your lunch, maybe do your team meeting then in the middle of the day, and then have a coffee, go for a run, and then hit the phones. That's the process for, for demand generation, whether for your teams or the people you consult. If you call a lead within five minutes, you're 10 times more likely to get a connect with them than if you wait another five minutes. That's crazy. I walk into these companies, I'm like, how fast do you call your leads? And they're like, we never measured it. They come back, three days, <laughs> on average. Okay, here's a very easy way to quadruple your return on marketing. Call your leads in five minutes. Ridiculous. It's easy to operationalize, okay? And then, if you call leads six times, your likelihood to get them on the phone is 90%. But most organizations call their leads once. Easy optimization on your prospecting guide, okay? Whether for you or for your clients. So here's what a prospecting, you know, we we've have cadences from, from Sales Loft. We've got Outreach.io. This whole sales automation space has been great. We can set up this sequence. It's what's in the sequence that's interesting. So here's a company that, you know, not quite exactly like you, but it is an agency. They're an agency that help, um, maybe some of you are like this, they help uh, people set up Shopify to, for their e-commerce function. Okay, so they had this really cool webinar. Hey, Shopify Plus just came out. Watch our webinar. We'll tell you all about it and whether it's for you. So you get a bunch of leads from that. Most people I work with, this is their prospecting guide. Hey, Michelle, it's Dwight from ICT. We specialize in creating ready-to-sell e-commerce websites for your business. Are you free at 1 p.m. to discuss? Not bad. Elevator pitch. It's okay. 
The problem is the second email, the second voicemail and email is the same friggin' thing. Are you getting these voicemails? Like 95% of the voicemails I gave, same friggin' thing. Unless you're selling pencils, I can't imagine that that's optimized. So let's talk about a prospecting playbook that you can teach a junior seller in your organization to use that will be effective. Step number one is just teach. I mean, salespeople don't understand how to look at a LinkedIn profile and figure out what to do with it. You know, where, what does it mean if they have worked at the company for one month versus 10 years? That's a big difference. What does it mean if they studied psychology versus business undergrad? What does it mean if their last job was CTO? These are all huge signals to us that the mere modern salesperson doesn't know how to do. Quick little tangent, I was, this is actually a company we invested in, and I was on a um, trip with my son, two hour drive, and I had to do a diligence call on this woman, she's CEO of the company. And my, I said, Zane, I'm sorry, I gotta do a call, a business call, but listen, I know you sometimes like to hear about business, so I'll put it on speaker and you can listen, and then we can have, you can ask me questions at the end about it. He's like, oh, that's great. And I'm like, in fact, why don't you check out Michelle's background on LinkedIn and let me know what you think of her background. So he takes my phone, he looks at her background, he's like, oh, dad, Michelle's background's awesome. And I was like, why? He's like, look, there's a bridge and there's water and there's a city and like it's, you know. I was like, so we had some due diligence training there. It's a true story. All right, so, so that's our sort of first. And then we've got our first level data that many of us have like, well, what does it mean are our salespeople even using the fact that we sent them 27 emails and they opened two? Those two tell us a ton. Can I tell what blog articles they read? That tells us a ton. What webinars they attended. I can use that and, and these buyers forget that they did this and they feel like they're reading our mind and we're a different type of seller for them. And now I can actually put out something that's meaningful. It's Ryan from ICT. I noticed you, you know, went to our webinar. I took a moment at your your, to look at your e-commerce presence and I'm gonna send you a few ideas on how to improve it. Let me know if you wanna catch up and, and go through that. And two days later, I, you know, I found this case study of one of our customers that are in your industry that you might like, and let me know if you want me to walk you through it. Like, this is the type of stuff that's gonna grab attention. When you're leave, leaving the same voicemail, you're getting those, I, I hang up right when I hear the person's name. These voicemails I don't hang up on. Maybe they're not calling me back, but there's a value-adding dialogue that's happening. And the breakup email is the most important one. Hey, Ryan at ICT, I've not heard back from you, so I'm going to assume that you, you, you were effectively increased your e-commerce website. Um, it's no longer a priority, so call me if anything changes. You get the highest callback rate on that. So if you do end up setting up a prospecting guide, make sure that your sellers get to this point. Okay. Now, you're selling to big companies. Tiffany was tell, talking about selling to big companies. Let me tell you how this is working. I, I asked some of the companies I work with who sell the big companies what they're doing because they're getting meetings. I'm like, how are you getting these meetings? So this company, VTS, they sell to um, huge developers, like the skyscrapers that are out there, the people that own those skyscrapers. That's who they sell to. Like they own 20, sky, you know, 50 skyscrapers across the country. They're multi-billion dollar developers. That's who they're trying to get at, the CEOs of those companies. So this, this 25-year-old at VTS who is making, I don't know, 75,000 a year trying to set these appointments, right? He, he, got a, he, he was trying to get an appointment with this guy, the, the chairman of Cushman Wakefield. So he went online. This is a multi-million dollar deal. He went online. He found out this guy wrote a book called My Montauk because he's got a summer home in Montauk and he likes to go fishing on his boat. So what he did was he had custom made, oh, he, also, he looked, found his birthday in his background, so he had custom made a, uh, a fishing bucket with the book on it, and he sent it to the guy's business. And he found out he was speaking at this conference on Israeli bonds, so he went there to meet him and ask him about the bucket. Now, the guy was shipped in a limo, security, couldn't even get close to him. It's like, bummer. So he sends him a note. Hope all is well, Bruce. Yeah, I want to reach out. I was hoping you, to meet you at the luncheon yesterday. I want to see how you like the bucket for your birthday and if you used it on your fishing trip. Also, I'd, I'd relish the opportunity to stop by your office to discuss, discuss VTS. We work with all these other big brokers, and here's a little bit on what we do. Your friend Steven Seagal is actually a big fan. Please let me know if you have any availability in the next couple of weeks. Later that day, 
We'll set something up. Laura, please arrange the buckets. Great. Woo. Now, it's good stuff, all right? Now, are you going to do that if you're selling ten, twenty thousand dollars engagements? No. This is a multi-million dollar deal. But it gives you a sense of the creativity. This one I don't quite. These these folks sell sort of like McKinsey-esque uh, engagements. These are also multi-million dollar accounts, and they're going after Wells Fargo. He's a little throw-uppy in the beginning. It's a lot of like. We do this, we do that. It's a little bit too me, me, me. But then he, he actually listened to the Wells Fargo CEO's quarterly call and quoted it and said, you know, as John Shrewsbury discussed in his Q3 earnings, this is how we're aligned with it. And later that day, hi, Arthur. I, you know, I get pitched all the time, and I want to say thank you for the targeted and relevant email. I'd like to learn more how's next Tuesday work. Okay, so just if you're selling big deals, smaller deals, the transactional stuff, bigger deals, there's some examples. All right, discovery call guide. How do we teach you folks, you get in front of a client and you, you ask them questions. It comes naturally. I always, my students are always like, Mark, how do, we, how do you sell? Because all, all the students, they do show up and throw up, right? They think selling is about a great pitch. And I tell them, here's the best thing you can do to practice selling. This Friday, you go to a wedding, you go to some business event, find a stranger, See how long you can ask them questions before they get pissed off at you, before they feel interrogated. That's the simplest example. If you can get good at that, you're going to be great at sales. I'll, I'll tell them, like, I practice a lot, and I go to these weddings. I go up to this guy, and I talk to him for like 30 minutes. All he knows is my name. I asked him question after question. At one point, he's like, hey, no, one even, no one's ever asked me that question. That's a great question. I could tell him, like, changes his perspective. He goes over to his wife after 30 minutes. He only knows my name. He's like, that guy, Mark, he's an amazing guy. Just because I asked these thought-provoking, curious questions that changed his perspective, that's selling. How do we codify that for a mere mortal? Right, so I use a really simple thing called the discovery call guide. It's not a script. It's just the, and I'll show you what's in here, but it's just, it's the patterns we looked at in the gone data. The first five minutes is rapport. How do I build rapport? Right, so like rapport for, for a mere mortal, it's like, listen, it starts when I, when I meet him in the coffee room or if I get right on the call and we're waiting for people to show up in the webinar. Sometimes I do some work for BCG and like we're with a client and we're waiting for everyone to show up and everyone's quiet. What are you talking about? Dude, this is our opportunity. We got all the people sitting here. Let's start chit-chatting about like, meaningless, what seems like meaningless stuff about this hire they made or an acquisition they just did. This is gold. This is gold. They think we're chatting, we're qualifying, we're discovering. If it doesn't work, hey, why'd you take this meeting? Nice and open-ended. Number one and two, you try those both, 80% of the people just start talking about their business. Beautiful. Every once in a while, you get someone who's like, hey, enough about me. Come on, I showed up to learn about your product. Tell me what you got. So great, no problem. It would take me four hours to tell you my business. When I talk to people like you, they're either trying to decrease, uh, increase return on ad spend, uh, increase the uh, attribution, or decrease CAC. Which one's your biggest problem? And I'll tell you about that. At least I have some guidance, then we can dig into the why. All right, so I'm going to give them some guidance on rapport. I'm going to give them some guidance on like the awareness stage. What are your biggest problems? What are your biggest needs? Why is, why is the campaign measurement become a priority now? All right, I'm going to talk about the consideration. What have you tried? Did it work? What do you want to try this year? Why do you think that's going to work? Are you looking for the cheapest one? Who else needs to be involved, and what does it need to be done by? Okay, the number, okay, I ask hundreds of companies, why do you lose deals? I'm kind of amazed at this. I, I would have thought it was competition. Everyone says to me, it's because they just go quiet. The sense of urgency. That's the number one reason. And so everyone's, how do you develop urgency? We're good at understanding budget. We're good at understanding like authority. But urgency, that's a tricky one. And this is a question, I like to put my questions that have value for me and the seller at the top. I, looked, I like to put my questions where it's mostly valuable for me at the end. And I hope that I have huge trust by my buyer because they're gonna be tough questions. And my urgency is I'm going to say to the buyer, okay, this all makes sense. You, you told me that you, you need to um, you know, increase your return on ad spend by 20% because you got hammered in Q3. The street's all over you folks. The CEO wants to know. The CEO has a pitch to the board, and she's looking to you for guidance on how to do it. You have a meeting with her in four weeks, 
and you need to understand how to pitch that. You're looking for that solution. Is that true? Now, here's the deal. What if you don't increase return on ad spend? I'm not quite sure what the input. Let's say it's January and hasn't gone up. What happens? That's the sense of urgency. If they're freaking out, you got to sail. When they go sideways, you remind them. People don't connect the dots neurologically. And that's the key question that's going to get us there. So that's going to teach my reps. And then this is where I end. The transition from discovery to the, to the, the pitch is just the, like the folks in the last session said, the active listening of like, this is what I found out from you. You want to do X, Y, Z by this day. Is that correct? Yes. And then you have a soft close opportunity. Because you can say, if I could show you the answer to this, and it costs less than $150,000, which you said is worth $4 million to you next year, are you going to do business with me? They don't even know what I do yet. They know very little about what I do. If they say yes to that, and why wouldn't they? I just asked them, would they spend $150,000 to create $4 million, if I can prove it to them? Neurologically, they're committed to you. Soft close. Right? You can teach your folks how to do that. All right, and then the, the playbook, the, there's a qualifying matrix. Does anyone use BANT or MEDIC? Okay, there's qualifying matrices that's a cheat sheet for reps to check off everything that's happening because a sales call is a very intense experience. And it's just, if you're managing a rep, all you want to do is when you get off the call, let's say we use BANT, which is budget, authority, need time, and it was, it was invented at Intel, um, like, 30 years ago, um, or maybe it was IBM, but it's just like when you do, every time you meet with a rep, you're like, how'd the call go? You just say, what's the bant? And we just go through each one. And you're wiring the rep to get at that information. And what's really hot in vogue these days is to have a success qualifying matrix too. Last presentation, they talked about customer experience. I study customer attention and churn aggressively. Most churn problems is not because of the onboarding, it's because of how it was sold. In B2B, right, for your folks who are selling, most bad experiences are because of the way it's sold, what was promised. And so I can sell a deal without getting commitment from the end user or if there's any IT thing related, but our, our journey for customer success is gonna be compromised, okay? So just real quick on the, on the pitch side, you know, you go through all this great discovery with your rep and then they end up giving the same friggin' demo. That's a waste. Now, you, as great salespeople, natural born sellers, we, you know, when I watch natural born sellers, they give the different demo every time, different terminology, different order of offerings, they, they customize it, it's amazing. That's hard to do. But when I studied the demos at HubSpot, I found that like 90% of them could be summarized into three different swim lanes, three orders of the pitch. And so now I was able to standardize this for my team and say, listen, I know it's really hard to just do discovery and then give them a custom demo. But it's easier to do discovery with my guide and then just match them with wh which of the three do you think is the best fit and give them that pitch. Three, four, five, something like that. And same with the onboarding. The onboarding can't be generic. You know, if they get promised X, Y, Z, the onboarding has to be in line with that as well. I actually think you folks are good at that. I think you folks are good at from what I've been when hearing. Okay, hiring. What do you look for to hire? Okay. My first, uh, let's see, I think it was the eighth salesperson I hired. I actually grabbed the number one seller from a big public company in Boston. Couldn't believe we got her. Uh, I think we had 15 people at HubSpot at the time. We were in a garage across from MIT. And this <laughs> top seller wanted to come join. And I literally ro rolled out the red carpet and said, welcome to HubSpot, teach us to sell. I can't wait to learn. And six months later, I was amazed that they were not the top rep. They weren't terrible, but they weren't the best. And I was like, how is this possible? Number one out of 800. And they don't, we, are just, we don't know what we're doing. And what I realized was the person that, if I thought about their environment, they were literally running Super Bowl ads, the company that the person came from. You knew what, what they were selling within two minutes. And when you were selling HubSpot all the time, no one knew what HubSpot was. No one knew what inbound marketing was. It was a complete evangelistic sell. And I realized at that point, to sit in a conference like this and ask what your neighbor looks for in salespeople is very dangerous because the optimal salesperson is correlated with your context. Who you sell, where you sell, 
the value prop that you sell, the complexity, the competitive landscape, all these things, okay? But I have found, even though it's different, it can be engineered. And we don't lean into the stats as much as we should. And so what I did was I just sat back and I said, okay, um, what are the 10 things that I'm seeing in our top performers? And how are they weighted? And what I codified, like what would I mean by coachability? What would a top score in coachability versus a bottom score in coachability look, sound like? What about curiosity? What would that, I clearly define that and worked on it. And so I, I kind of measured each one of these and I put it through a loop. So even if I hired three people, six months later, Mary is crushing it. Bob is struggling. Why is Mary crushing it? And are we looking for that in our interview process? And why is Bob struggling? And how did that sneak through? So I could iterate on this formula and it became so critical as I got to take on more hires and even top people to hire. This became a critical formula. Now we hired a lot of people and as you, after you got many dozens, I was able to give my, my PhD MIT buddies on stats the data and ran a regression analysis of the scores against success. And this was the first regression. I'm gonna tell you the end answer on where we ended up, but this is the first regression. So all the blue bars to the left were negatively correlated with sales success. And the bars to the right were strongly correlated. What was crazy about this is look at the stuff at the bottom. This is the sleazy cigar smoker. You know what I mean? All the stuff we think about good sellers, closing, objection handling, convincing, they were negatively correlated. And the stuff we look at is like a great consultant or advisor, stuff you're good at, preparation, domain experience, intelligence. And this totally set the, a different tone for the type of salesperson I wanted to go find. Very different from what I was getting counsel from the folks who've been in there for decades. Huge opportunity for us. Okay, these three ended up in the top five for us. Which one was number one? How many people think intelligence was the most correlating factor towards success in the HubSpot environment? How many think it was coachability? How about curiosity? Good audience. I think you got it, coachability. First audience in a long time. That most people say curiosity, they were very close. It took me a year and a half to find the coachability one. It took me a year and a half and it's my favorite thing to look for. And I think it's a big one for you folks because I don't think you can find that like, you can't find you. You can't go find you, right? You want to go run your own agency. You need to go find someone in the right career trajectory, and we'll talk about it in a few minutes, and coachability is going to be a big deal. Have the same, right playbook, you hire for coachability, we're on the right track. So my most important sales process in my interview, here, I'm just going to give you my interview. I kind of warm, oh, sorry, just so we can absorb that here. I, war, I see in the, in the lobby, do they know who I am? Do they ask me questions? It's an opportunity for them. I warm them up. What do you want to do with your career? I ask them about how they ranked in their last role. You know, and I ask them, like, why weren't you, know, you know, why did you get so high in your ranking? Oh, you know, blah, blah, blah. Here's how I sell. Why weren't you number one? Everyone says it's their territory. They all blame the territory. Then I ask which territory is the number one, and then I go call that person. Little tip for you. All right? So a little... Little trick when you're, pro, you're getting people. Then I do a role play, coachability. This is my most important thing. Do a role play. Then I stop and I have them self assess. First off, I tell them, I have them self assess, how'd you do? And then I tell them in every single interview, I give one piece of positive feedback and one piece of improvement. So that they don't think that they're freak, they're bombing. One piece of positive, one need for improvement. And I have them redo the role play. That for me is the most important thing. If in 10 minutes I can teach you a little bit on how to sell, I cannot wait to spend a day with you. I cannot wait to spend a week with you, especially if I build a playbook that I just talked about, that repeatable playbook. Hire coachability, build the playbook. Sometimes I talk to people and um, they're like, oh, dude, you know, Bob's not working out. When did you hear about Bob? When did you figure it out? Oh, like the second day. I'm like, how did that happen? We're asking behavioral interview questions to salespeople. What are you gonna do with Bob to train him in the first month? Do that in the interview. Give him your playbook. Do role plays. Teach him to sell your service. It's gonna be so enlightening as to how he'll do. So sometimes light bulbs go off when you start training him. And Red Arback, the Celtics owner said, you can't teach height. So what he means is like, you know, if someone's struggling to learn your service, I think we're gonna get him there. If someone has discomfort talking about money or picking up the phone, we're gonna to have to hire a psychologist, okay? So it's like, 
decipher between the problems you want to take on and really weigh the stuff that is going to be hard to teach, okay? All right, and then this is big for you, okay? So let me tell you a story. Last year, I consulted for a public company that sells home alarms. Not a very sexy company, all right? Home alarms. They're based in, like, the Southwest. And the biggest problem they had was their reps were quitting. They'd, hi- they'd spend a lot on college recruiting, hire these 22-year-olds out of, like, Arizona State and, like, you know, a lot of these state universities, and they'd all leave three years later to join a tech company for 50% more money. And I said, so what? And he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, so what? You can hire more. You are a path in their career. That's how these millennials think. We don't do like a 50-year golden watch journey anymore. We're looking for three-year segments. You nailed your three-year segment. He's like, holy shit, that's awesome. I'm like, you should start talking about that. You start branding yourself at the career center. This is your path to get into tech sales through our home alarm company. We're going to teach you to sell. And he did that. And he got more recruits. And they, they put him through a promotion path and made him managers. And guess what? Less people quit. They were so thankful on what this company did. Yeah, they got the calls, but they were so thankful. And their tenure actually increased. So just something for you to think about. In you and replicating sales is not finding you. You know, you're not going to find them at HubSpot. You're not going to find them at Google. You're going to find them at like ADP. All right, you're going to find them. Think about the companies. Like, who, where do they go and find these sellers, these, these people, and teach them to sell? And it's not the sexiest sell today. Old school media is an example. I hired a bunch of people out of radio. They're amazing. Okay, so just think about where you're looking. They're probably not going to be, you know, 20 years experience making half a million dollars. You're right. You can't afford them. You know, some of you can, but not a lot of you, especially your first one. That's a big bet. But you can take a gamble if you think about it in a career journey, okay? And um, just remember, great salespeople, you're not going to put up an Indeed ad and get them to apply. You've got to think about who those companies are, ADP, whoever it is. Jeez, ADP is going to sue me after this speech. Um, <laughs> You know, whoever it is, you think about, like, what the career journey would be and go call into those environments. Go find those people. Maybe even meet them here. The other piece to this retention thing is, um, is this comp. We don't talk enough about this comp plan approach that I've used in HubSpot and a lot of companies. So it's crazy that I see people. I'm like, how do you promote your salespeople? Like, how do you think about raises with salespeople? I'm like, oh, we do an annual review, and usually, like, on average, we give them a 3% inflation raise. And I'm like, that's BS, man. Like, sales, success and failure in sales is so quantifiable. You know what I mean? I can't look at HR and marketing and, like, my delivery people. It's really hard to quantify. Like, oh, that's my best delivery person by 7%. Like, that's hard to do. Sales, I can get there. I can get That's my best salesperson by 7%. So we can be so quantifiable in how we promote people. And so what I did was like, hey, you join our company, you know, 40K base, 40K variable. I know options don't really apply in this room as much, but here's your, and how do you get promoted? You hit those targets. Once you sell $60,000 of recurring revenue monthly and average $5,000 a month for three months in a row, I'll promote you. I'm going to give you a $10,000 raise on your variable, and there's your new targets. Sales, if if it's one guy made it in seven months, one person, it took 25 months but it's clear as day. And I was able to keep reps for seven years when the average was 2.2 on an inside sales team. They just keep going up the ranks. And so anyone hire SDRs or know what those are? SDRs, BDRs? So these are, we're getting really into specialization in sales. This might be a good starting point for you if you're a one-person sales team right now. Just hire a junior person to set appointments. I'll let you look at this, but this is what we use for the SDRs. That is a brutal, one of my students said, I, I, she said uh, last week, she's like, yeah, I just hire SDRs. I'm like, listen, you were in sales. All the other students in this class have no idea what that is. What's an SDR? She said, it's the shittiest job in sales. All right? And this is like, like you're setting appointments. You're cold calling. It's brutal. And you want these people to last 12 months in the job. If their job is changing every three months because you're slowly rewarding them, including putting them into account executive training, that's super motivating, especially for this young you know, this, this young person that wants to move fast, okay? All right, let's, let's end up with the coaching part. So, um, 
First off, what does a sales manager do? They, they don't like run the forecast. They don't do the job for the rep. Okay, when you promote a sales manager the first time, most of them will do the job for the rep. And that's just gonna make your rep lazy and it's gonna make them not confident. A sales manager needs, needs to get to the revenue through the reps. Don't even go to the sales calls. They need to be a great sales coach and that's gonna scale. So what's a great sales coach? I'll use a golf analogy. True story again, I broke my hand golfing this year. Broke my hand. Had a 70 year old surgeon. He's like, how'd you break your hand? I said golfing, he's like, I've been practicing for 45 years, I've never heard that. It says a lot about my golf game. All right, so one golf pro said, Mark, take a swing, and I did. He's like, here's what I want you to do. Turn your hand over, lean back in your stance, put more weight on your right foot, not left. Think one o'clock, not two o'clock on your backswing, and give me more wrist on contact. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. And the second guy was like, all right, Mark, take a swing, and I did. He, he's like, try this grip and do 100 swings with that. 20 minutes later, he's like, how's that feel? I'm like, that feels good. I'm getting this. He's like, now lean back in your stance. Take another 100 swings. Really basic example, but having promoted like 20, 25 of these sales managers, they all do what the first golf pro did. They see the 80 things that are broken with this new salesperson, like you may with your hire, and they throw up on them for 90 minutes with feedback, and they're just lost. Great sales managers can see the 90 things, but they understand the one thing that's going to make the biggest difference this week, and they focus on that. And they use the data where possible. I call it matrix-driven sales coaching. All right, so this is an example of how we can set up our flow. Confirm the first. This is, uh, each color is a different rep. And we're just going through. Confirm first meeting. Verify their needs. Got a verbal from the decision maker. Got a signed contract. Turned it into revenue. Anne in green and Fred in purple missed their number. Why? Different reasons. Fred doesn't do enough activity and can't convert the activity. My coaching's way different. And another nuance here that notice that each one of these stages is not a thing the seller did. It's a thing that the buyer did. So important. It's not I gave them a demo. It's not I sent them a contract. It's stuff the buyer did because that's showing progress in the journey. And that's going to hone your salesperson on how to move the buyer through the journey. So needs verified. That's basically they gave him a discovery call. But I didn't call, gave him a discovery call. I call that needs verified, which means I gave him a discovery call and then I sent him an email summarizing what I found. You need to increase return on ad spend by 20% by this date because your CEO said so. Can you just confirm that's accurate? And they wrote back and said yes. The predictability of that action to a close, way higher than I just gave him a discovery call. Okay? All right, so when I... When I manage these folks, I put together these coaching plans. At the beginning of every month, I have a one-on-one -on -one with each seller. If you build a sales team, one hour with each seller, and I ask them what they want to work on. I look at their numbers, and we create a plan. What's your diagnosis? How am I going to coach them through it? And again, sales is highly quantifiable, so how will I know that it goes up or down? I have extremely common issues lack of personal goals, time management issues, and how to fix them. Where to call reluctance, happy to talk to you about after. Prospecting depth, how to go deeper, how to get more personalized, and then how to develop urgency. I talked to you about the urgency one. But one of my favorite ways to do this is in a film review. So if you bring on two or three reps, or you have two or three reps, I know some of you do, I love to get them in a room, especially in the beginning, every day at five o'clock and listen to film. So one person's on the hot seat, they record a call, and one person in the room I assign to positive feedback, and the other person I assign to negative feedback. We listen to the call, and then the, the person on the hot seat, whose call it was, they get to self-assess. This is what I like that I did, this is what I could have done better. Then the, the positive person goes, then needs for improvement, then we open up, to the room, open up to the room, and then I go, and I summarize it. This is a great way to build camaraderie and to learn from one another, film review. You do them every day, you do them every week, it's great. You learn every day, you'll learn a lot faster. Okay? All right. Um, the last thing is uh, just in a line in sales and marketing. Once you got the thing cooking, you want to align these two teams. I've talked to 500 sales teams and, 500 and marketing teams. They hate each other. You know this. They hate each other. All, all marketers think that salespeople are overpaid, spoiled brats. And all sellers think that marketers do arts and crafts all day. And they go back to their respective corners 
and they do their cold calls and their trade show booths, and that is the kiss of death. And we have an opportunity in today's environment to quantify both of these elements. So some people do the lead score. I'm not crazy about the lead score. I feel like we end up with 50 pieces of data going into it, and suddenly this intern downloads an ebook 50 times, and they're called, and some CEO signs up to our blog and doesn't get a call. That's so broken, right? So we just, I just try to simplify it in terms of like, where are they in their engagement, and how good of a fit of a company are they are? It's not good if, like, if a salesperson gets a lead that you generate, and they call them, like, that was a terrible lead. It was the intern at a company. Yeah, but tell me about the company. Was it a good fit? Oh, yeah, it's a perfect company. Sell it. Who do you think told the intern to download the ebook? Probably the CEO. It's the company, not the, not the role. Don't even call the intern. Call the CEO and just tell, tell her that people were downloading stuff and ask what's going on. Right, so it's far more about the company. We don't want to let this, those sellers off the hook. And I already showed you the data on how often we, we should call these things. I can, I can create the sales SLA where it's basically like all this, remember, call lead in five minutes, call lead six times in the next two weeks. I can build that on my CRM and just build this dashboard, which is called the do not be on it dashboard. Very simple. It goes out every night. And if you're on it, you're not calling your leads right. That's your mortgage payment. I'm giving you these. Call them, and they, and, and they learn how to do that. So now I can measure both these things, the marketing SLA and the sales SLA, every day. It's September 15th. Where are we on the revenue goal from lead generation? How are we calling our leads? Sales and marketing are accountable to each other, okay? All right, so hopefully we get an insight on the machine. We didn't cover it all, but hopefully this is far better than just like hire someone like myself and give them a quota and you have more insight on how to make this more data-driven and how to actually make this realistic, even if we've got tight budgets.